Hello you guys, my name is Ivy. Welcome back to my channel for another video. Today we are going to be doing a video on a serial killer. This is literally like the fifth or sixth time I have tried to film this and gotten like interrupted or so tongue-tied that I just like had to restart <laughs> at like the very very beginning of the video. So I really hope that this just goes through smoothly. I don't know if I have like jitters or what but no more of that so this isn't a super popular case or very very well known but the reason why there's so much information on it is similar to ted bundy they conducted a lot of interviews with him with the fbi profilers and psychologists to learn more about the quote-unquote criminal mind so without further ado let's get right on into the video so michael was born on July 26th of 1959 to his parents Daniel and Patricia Ross. Now they did not have a good or a healthy marriage. They actually got married shortly after she knew, found out that she was pregnant. They lived on a farm in Connecticut and Patricia just absolutely hated farm life. She never wanted to get married. She never wanted to have kids. She had a lot of problems with her mental health. She was a borderline schizophrenic. And she just was not in a good environment for her and then that did not make a great environment for her children and after having four kids and two abortions she left with another man to go to North Carolina shortly after she returned she was immediately institutionalized for her mental health issues and while she was in there her psychiatrist said that she often dealt with suicidal thoughts and she would talk about wanting to harm her children physically or mentally. Patricia definitely did a lot of mental abuse to her children. She would feed them all raw meat and then, or spoiled meat, and then laugh at them when they would get sick. She would purposely ruin the girls' clothing so they would be embarrassed to go to school. They all dealt with a lot of mental abuse. I don't know if there was a ton of physical abuse. Most of the siblings don't really comment that there was so i'm gonna assume that there wasn't but one of michael's sisters actually said that michael was definitely the mom's scapegoat he definitely got the majority of her aggression and her anger for example he was a bedwetter and every time he would wet the bed she would make him strip his bed and hang out all of his sheets outside so that everyone that would drive past and all of his siblings would knew that he wet the bed i guess for just like embarrassment at one point she tried to convince him to kill his pet dog and she told him that it had this disease and he needed to put it out of its misery she just dealt with a lot of issues on her own and michael got a lot of that backlash now michael himself says that he does not remember a whole lot about his childhood and only really remembers how much he loved working on the farm with his dad now they were in the poultry business that they raised chickens another thing i want to say about michael's childhood is around when he was younger, his uncle was accused of sexually molesting him, and shortly after that, the uncle committed suicide. There is nothing that's really ever come of this. There was no conviction. There was no court. They, I mean, he committed suicide, so it was kind of just done. And then after he committed suicide, they needed an extra farm hand. So Michael started doing his uncle's duties on the farm, which consisted of killing the chickens and he was only eight years old at this time so he would actually strangle the chickens with his bare hands and that was like his duty on the farm as he got older he got more and more into this farm life he wanted to help his dad more and more he really really loved it that was like his passion in life that's what he wanted to do for the rest of his life so when he got older and when he was entering high school he wasn't really social at all and this is when he first started stalking girls um also when he was in high school he took an iq test and it received a score of 122 which is relatively high for the average joe it's definitely not a low score and the fact that he was a farmhand and his school wasn't his top priority i definitely think it's a good thing to consider how mentally smart and mentally developed this man was so in 1977, Michael started to attend Cornell University and was majoring in animal sciences and his goal was to graduate and then continue running his family's poultry business. When he entered college, he kind of 
went off the deep end so to speak he started drinking a lot he started sleeping around he started experimenting with drugs he joined a fraternity most of his fraternity brothers described him as being a bit of a loner but he was very driven in his schooling and he was a bit arrogant at times so around this time he met a girl named connie young who was michael's kind of first true love in life so to speak and eventually michael got kicked out of his fraternity and him and connie started renting an apartment together during this time connie actually got pregnant and had an abortion and that is kind of when shit hit the fan for this couple michael became very very lazy he didn't have a job he wasn't really attending class he was drinking all the time he was starting to become a little bit aggressive with connie and connie was just honestly getting pretty fed up with it she was extremely dedicated to her studies she was trying to complete her bachelor's in three years she was in the rct program she just like wasn't about to deal with this stuff she wasn't about to put up with it so their relationship definitely started to have a lot of problems also during this time michael's sexual fantasies started to get more and more aggressive and he was constantly demanding sex from connie and it was getting to the point where it was almost kind of concerning him and he was getting these fantasies about stalking these women and raping and killing them so eventually in april of 1981 he was walking around campus and there was a co-ed and he pulled her to a saluted area raped her and let her go now after this he vowed to himself that he was never going to do it again it was a one and done deal but he broke this promise to himself only three days later where he pulled another co-ed off of campus and he was pinning her down and he heard other people around and he basically got spooked out and let her go so at this point michael had really convinced himself that once he had left cornell all of these problems he was currently having were going to disappear and then he decided that the fantasy wasn't ever going to leave his mind unless he fulfilled it so on may 12th of 1981 Michael followed a girl named Zung Kong Tu outside of their night class that they had together. He pulled her to a secluded area, raped her, and she basically told him that she knew who he was. And if he didn't let her go, she was going to tell everybody and get him in trouble. And that is when he decided that he had to kill her. So he ended up strangling this girl and thinking that she was dead, threw her into the BB lake. Um, she, however, was not dead and ended up drowning here. At this time, Michael was graduating college. He had accepted a job in North Carolina and was trying to convince Connie to go with him. And she basically said no. Their relationship was kind of just falling apart, essentially, and his parents were also splitting up at this time. So his mother then came to visit him in North Carolina, and he took this as a sign that his parents were rekindling their relationship and everything was gonna go back to the way it was and it was fine and it was basically just so Michael would sign away his rights to the share of the farm that he owned to his mother so she could sell it and gain a pretty hefty amount of money for this so definitely threw him a curveball and then right after this Connie actually flew down to see him to completely cut things off basically she didn't want anything to do with him she was dating someone else she was just kind of over it at this point so he was definitely dealing with a lot of things in his mind he was having a very hard time coming to terms with that the life that he had planned for himself his whole life was no longer going to happen he wasn't going to be running the chicken farm that he planned on he wasn't going to get married and have this you know magical life with connie it was all just kind of falling apart so at this time he decided that he was going to go home when he was driving on the highway he spotted a young girl carrying her groceries with her seventh month year old baby this was a small town they didn't really have a lot of crime and he got out of his car and offered to help her carry groceries to her house and being the fact that it was a safe place this girl agreed and once they got to their backyard, he came from behind her and grabbed her and dragged her into a soybean field. He basically told her that if she didn't comply to whatever he wanted her to do, that she, he was going to kill her baby. So he was repeatedly beating her. He wasn't, the fantasy wasn't filling itself out and it was getting him frustrated. And the more frustrated he would get, 
the more he would beat her. So eventually he thought that she was dead and he left. However, she was not and she actually managed to crawl across the street to a neighbor to call the police. So immediately road barriers were put up, but Michael was just completely long gone. They weren't going to catch him. But she did survive and her baby did survive. So then in September of that same year, Michael was then on a business trip to Chicago. And on this business trip, he ended up following a 17-year-old girl home and grabbing her off the street. This was around 11 o'clock at night and someone who lived on that street was going to check their door if their door was locked before they went to bed saw this happen and called the police now luckily there was a patrol car only 100 feet away from where the call was taking place so as soon as he saw the police car he got spooked he ran away now coincidentally when the police were escorting this young girl home ross had parked his rental car on the same street that she lived on so when the police were escorting her home she started freaking out and was like that is the car that's the car that the man was driving that tried to take me so they the police officer got out of the car he was arrested he pleaded guilty and was charged with a 500 dollars fine for the crime so then after this business trip he decided that he was going to go home for the holidays connie agreed to have thanksgiving with him and his mom and michael kind of thought that this was going to be like the rekindling of the mother and sonship that he needed to have with his mom his relationship with connie and connie and his mom just did not get along at all and it turned out to be kind of a big disaster connie went to christmas with her family she went to be with her boyfriend that she had had and this again just really upset ross so then on january 4th of 1982 a 17 year old tammy lee williams was walking home from her boyfriend's house when michael ross spotted her in his car he pulled over and offered her a ride, and when she refused, he dragged her to the woods, raped and strangled her, and covered her body with leaves and rocks. In May of that same year, Pamela Piera was walking on Route 211 when Michael spotted her. He pulled over, offered her a ride, and when she refused, he pulled her to the side of the road, raped and strangled her, and left her body there. Then on June 15th of 1982, Deborah Smith Taylor was driving home with her husband and they had run out of gas. A police officer had picked the young couple up and drove them to a service station. And he said that the couple was fighting at this time and Deborah said that she could find her own ride home. She must have been pretty pissed off they couldn't get any gas and um, ended up taking a ride home with Michael Ross and that was the last that she was ever seen. Her body was then found in that October. So in August of that year, Michael had to return to Chicago to receive his sentencing for the crime that he'd committed earlier that year, the 17 year old girl who he had gotten caught trying to kidnap. He ended up getting six months for this and another thousand dollar fine and did not get released until December of that same year. He then decided to move to Norwich, Connecticut, where he started dating a single mother of three named Deborah Wallace. During this time, he did rape another girl, but then let her go. And then on November 16th of 1983, Robin Savinke was walking home from her boyfriend's house. Michael Ross had spotted her, offered her ride. She refused and he grabbed her raped her and strangled her and then on april 22nd of 1984 on easter sunday april Bruis and leslie shelley had asked their parents if they could go to the movies and instead of calling them at the end and asking for a ride home they decided to walk three miles to the girls houses they both lived on the same street they were around 14 and 15 they were best friends, they had known each other since they were seven, they were completely inseparable. Michael had spotted them, pulled over and asked them for a ride and they did accept it. And after he had drove across the Rhode Island border, one of the girls actually pulled a knife on him and he started freaking out and kind of after that they both pretty much complied to anything that he asked them to do. He ended up putting Leslie, the younger of the two, in his trunk and got April out and raped and killed her. Then he got Leslie out and Michael actually says that he just couldn't for some reason rape her. It was like he, he said that because she was so young and she was complying so much and she, he, she basically would have done whatever he would have asked her to do. But it was so real to the fantasy that he was, you know, trying to fulfill for himself that it was like he just couldn't do it. 
so that was the only one of his eight murder victims that he never raped. So then on June 15th of 1984, Wendy Barbo was walking to a convenience store after school. It was around 4.30 and eyewitnesses that day said that there was a man in a three-piece suit following her and that was the last that Wendy was ever seen. So at this point, obviously the police are putting two and two together, connecting these crimes, seeing the similarities in them, seeing the similar car that's been identified for a lot of them. So they start to look for a particular car. Due to the places that he was hiding these bodies, they had already assumed that he was pretty familiar with this area. So they ran a check through the DMV of anyone who had a car similar to the ones that had been identified for some of these murders and his eventually came up. So on June 24th of 1984, only a couple weeks after the murder of Wendy, Officer Mike Malchik came to Michael Ross's house to ask him questions about these murders and basically decided pretty quick into the interview, I guess if you want to call it, that he was not the murderer. He thought that this just seemed like a normal guy and right before he was about to leave, he ended up turning around and asking Michael what he had done on June 15th. And Michael just spouted out every detail of this day to a complete T, except for the time frame that Wendy went missing. So obviously he immediately thought that this date meant something to him, not to mention that he didn't have an alibi for where he would have been on the time that Wendy was taken and murdered. So then he decided to ask Ross what he was doing the day before that and the day after that, and he could not remember anything. So at this point, the officer was pretty convinced that this was definitely a suspect into some of these murders. So he asked Michael Ross to go down to the police station with him. Ross said it was fine. He thought it would kind of be fun to go and ride in a cop car. They got down to the police station. They started talking. He kind of told the officer about his life and he eventually just asked the officer, do you think I killed Wendy? And he said yes, that he did. And Michael Ross just completely admitted to 11 sexual assaults and seven of the eight murders that he committed. And two of them, they hadn't even connected to him at all. So that is definitely kind of a unique thing about this man. He, as soon as he was caught, it was almost like he wanted to get caught. Like he didn't even fabricate an alibi for where he would have been when Wendy was kidnapped. He didn't refuse to go down to the police station, which he obviously could have. They had no incriminating evidence. His car was barely similar to the ones that they had been identifying there were certain things in some of the witnesses saying that like the back windshield wipers were on of the car who had taken some of these girls and his car didn't have back windshield wipers it was just so many things that i feel like could have definitely gotten him off of this and he was just so he wasn't reluctant at all he was just like yep i'm guilty so i think that's kind of interesting it was almost like he wanted to be caught like he wanted to be saved from himself. So on December 13th of 1986, he was convicted of the murders of Tammy Williams and Deborah Taylor Smith. He was given two consecutive life sentencing and then he would then go to Connecticut to be tried for the four other murders that he was being charged for. He did receive, was found guilty of all four of these murders and in Connecticut, he was up for the death penalty. So he had to have another, it's not really a trial, I don't know how to explain it, but it's basically just where witnesses come come up and say whether or not they think that you have redeeming qualities, stuff like that to see if you get the death penalty or not. And in the state of Connecticut, if you can find one redeeming quality about a person, you cannot give them the death penalty. They, however, did not find any redeeming qualities in Michael Bruce Ross and he was given the death penalty on July 6th of 1987. So like I said before, he has done multiple interviews about his life, about the crimes that he has committed, and some of the things that he has to say about them are definitely interesting and definitely unique to him personally, at least in my opinion. He does say that he feels no remorse for any of his victims. He says the only one that sticks with him is Leslie Shelley, the girl, the only girl out of the eight that he didn't end up raping. And the only time he's ever even felt a slight remorse for any of the victims is when one of their mothers was testifying 
on the stand. He doesn't remember any of these girls' names. He can barely identify their pictures. It's honestly like he just didn't even, didn't even see them as people, at least in my opinion. That's what I feel like it seems like. He was also asked why he never sought out help in college. He obviously knew he had a problem. He didn't want to be doing the things he was doing, at least that's what he said. And he basically said that he had just convinced himself so deeply that these were one and done things. He wasn't going to keep doing them. And that was just enough for him. So when Ross was on death row, he did a lot of reading and a lot of research about why he was the way that he was. And he kind of boasted about this a little bit, like, which I mean, I guess like, you're on death row what kind of competition do you have but because he was so curious on why he was the way that he was he offered himself to be in research studies one of them being chemical research and the other one being surgical castration research now the court did not let him participate in that one but in the chemical research he was prescribed a mixture of Deborah Provera and the antidepressant Prozac and the combination of these two was in hopes of lowering his overactive sex drive. Now the Deborah Provera did heavily change his hormones which caused him to gain weight and with the weight gain and the change in hormones led him to fall into a severe depression. Now obviously he was already on I can't antidepressants so they had to take him off of the Deborah Provera and he actually said that being taken off of Deborah Provera was like being born blind getting your sight back and then someone taking it away it's very very interesting how he describes how he how his mind works it's very very interesting how he describes how his mind works if i can find the clip of him saying this i'll insert it but right now i'm just gonna read the quote in case it would get copyrighted this is him trying to explain what his thoughts of killing and raping women are like you know that everybody has a tune playing over and over inside their heads and if you have this tune that plays all day over and over it can drive you nuts and just imagine having thoughts of rape and murder and you can't get rid of it. Well, just like that tune, it'll be driving you nuts. No matter what you do to get rid of that tune, it's going to stay in your head. And that's how I am. I don't want those thoughts. So obviously, you know, he could be lying, whatever. But I think it is something to think about. He definitely seems like he, I mean, obviously he did all of these crimes on purpose, but it definitely seems like he wants to know why just as much as like the FBI and the psychologists do. It's very interesting. So despite all of these statements that he has made saying that his overactive sex drive, he believes has had a play in these cases, the statement about the analogy about the blind man, the analogy about the, the tune, um, none of those were used to say about how he shouldn't receive the death penalty. Another thing is, is both the defense and the prosecutor had psychiatric experts go and interview him. And both of them said, the ones that the defense sent and the one that the prosecutor sent, that a main reason for him committing these crimes was due to his overactive sex drive. And even though both of them agreed on that, the the experts, the people who literally get paid to do this, neither of them were asked to testify. The jury was just left completely in the dark about this. And honestly, Connecticut's law saying if you have run one redeeming quality, you don't get the death penalty. I definitely think that if this was shown in court, he wouldn't have received the death penalty, but that's just my opinion. So Ross did have the right to appeal the death penalty. He did appeal it several times. Um, he was shot down every single time. And then eventually on May 13th of 2005, he woke up that morning. He did not appeal the death penalty, which he could have. And he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. That is kind of all of the information I have on this case. But I kind of want to start something where I give all of the information of the case. And then I kind of talk to you guys about my thoughts on it let me know if you have any opinions on me doing this if you think it would be interesting if you have any interest in my opinion on the cases at all and let me know in the comments how you thought about this case so if only if you only wanted to hear the information you can just turn off this video but if you want to hear my opinion on this case and why i decided to do it then stick around so now that we're chatting i'm gonna get a little bit more comfortable so why i decided to do this case is because i think that the way that society is kids are kind of brought up to 
separate good and evil into two boxes like the superheroes and the villains in stories stuff like that but when you get older and when you really start to learn more things about people that's not the way it is there's arguably there's no person that fits in the just good box and the just evil box i mean i don't know i feel like this is definitely an interesting debate because there are people i mean legally if you're sentenced to death you're considered a monster you're considered evil whatever you want to believe that that is which would mean that you don't have any good in you you don't have any redeeming qualities but to say that side you kind of have to admit that there's people on the other side like there's only people that have good in them which if you have any religious beliefs know that that's only um god and jesus so to say that there's only people with bad you have to admit that there's people with only good which if you're religious at all you can't do so it's kind of like there are people like these people do have redeeming qualities and they do have something i don't know it's just i had this like like rehearsed in my head of everything that i wanted to say here and now i feel like i am forgetting literally everything i wanted to say um i will say that i mean i'll just put it out right now i know that not everybody's gonna agree with me but i personally do not agree with the death penalty if it were up to me i don't really think i'd i mean if i was the governor of any state i would never sign off on sentencing someone to death i wouldn't do it just because i feel like when you specifically look at this case i mean we went through all the evidence we went through his whole childhood and when was he ever really given a fair chance you know like yes he was smart yes he got into a good university he moved away from his family but was he ever given the chance to be anything more than what he lived up to be i mean with the way that society is you know boys and girls are taught from a very very young age that anything sexual you don't really talk about you kind of just pretend it's like it's almost like with like pooping and peeing like you just pretend it doesn't happen even though everybody goes through it and deals with it in some way do you guys know what i mean and i feel like if it was just normalized more maybe he would have felt comfortable enough to seek help or you know how many other people are out there like him who are struggling with something like this and feel like they can't go get help and they should be able to i think if he would have been you know 18 19 right in college stalking these women before he was hurting anyone if he would have gone and sought help i mean it might not have changed anything it might not have but like i don't know i just feel like it's so easy to label rapists and murderers and pretty much anyone in jail as being these evil people who are just horrible and that's just not i don't believe that i don't i think that everybody has good in them and does everybody use it no but i think that i mean at least i think for michael ross i think he was like he knew that there was something wrong with him he knew that he wasn't normal and he never even knew what it was like to be normal i mean i, I feel like i can't even wrap my brain around that i feel like this is a bad example but i saw a tiktok the other day and it was a girl who couldn't see pictures in her head and she like couldn't wrap her brain around other people can see like pictures in their head and i just i feel like that's how michael was he couldn't wrap his brain around the fact that not everybody had a thought in the back of their head all the time about harming women and again like a lot of these people a lot of these serial killers or sexual sadists who hurt women often have problems with their mom and if everything that his sister said about his mom is true he basically just kind of erased all of that from his memory i mean i can't even imagine the like emotional trauma that he has just from his family not even from the things that he's done i don't know i just feel like it's so easy when you watch you know the ted bundy documentaries and you know everything like that to just write these people off as being these evil awful people and i'm not by any means trying to justify the things that he did but i definitely do feel like he should have been given a second chance i mean i don't know i don't know i feel like he should definitely shouldn't have been given the death penalty i think that i mean he died when he was 45 and imagine if he would have just got life in prison and we could have been researching his brain the whole time he was alive and he himself could have been helping i mean he was trying to do that in prison so just imagine like how much we could have discovered from him 
if there's possibly another drug that could have been prescribed to him. I mean, think about how much time has passed. I mean, it's been 15 years since he's died. Literally, um, probably like three days before this video is going out. Like, it's probably gonna be pretty close to the day that he was executed. And think of how much technology has evolved and medicine has evolved in those 15 years. I mean, what if there is something out there that could be prescribed to him or tested on him that could help other people? I don't know. Those are my thoughts about this guy. Let me know your thoughts if you care or let me know if you like me kind of having like a chill little chat at the end of a more serious sit down video or if you absolutely hated it. But with that being said, I guess I'm just gonna end this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, check out my other true, true crime videos that I have and I will see you in my next video. Bye!